Hi, I'm Molly. <laughs> I'm Molly Cantor, and I've been a potter for about 12 years. I have a studio in Shelburne Falls. It could take me about a month and a half to make enough pots to fill the kiln, to really get to spend enough time with the pots and not work till midnight every night. And I do think about the kiln when I'm planning what to make. I think about the space in the bottom of the kiln that may not flash as much as some other parts of the kiln or may be a little cooler than other parts and I think about the glazes that mature at cooler temperatures. And I've always loved to draw. It sort of naturally occurred that I really wanted to put imagery on my pots. I do a lot of drawings based on nature, on you know birds and plants and bugs and um, often I'll go out in the garden and see what's blooming and draw that. Um, sometimes I will draw things from life or from my imagination or I have some funny old picture books that I like to look at sometimes. After I do the drawing, I carve away the background so that um, the white clay shows again and it's almost like a block print. It's an Italian technique originally, or at least the Italians gave it the name, Scrafito. And my dad is a printmaker, and so I grew up around printmaking and, and learned when I was a kid how to do linoleum blocks, um, which is very similar sort of carving technique. And Loading is pretty important to the firing process because the way things are loaded will determine the flame movement through the kiln. It's taken a lot of experimentation to find a way to stack the pottery in the kiln in a way that will cause the kiln to fire evenly. And I think it's about 50 cubic feet. I can fit about 300 pots in there of varying sizes. I can walk into the kiln. It's just my height, just an inch taller than me, I think. There's a door made of bricks that we sort of build in place to close up the kiln. The next morning at about 5 or 6 a.m., I arrive at the kiln and build a little campfire just outside the airports of the kiln where the air is going to be sucked into the kiln. You know, it, it takes a lot of Mm, practice and experience and knowledge to know how to fire a kiln like this. Did there are a lot of subtleties and a lot of things that can go wrong <laughs> in the firing that um, we have to be able to figure out how to correct and, and really be on top of stoking because just sort of slacking off of a few stokes can start the temperature dropping again and we place cones in six different places in the kiln, the top, middle, and bottom of both the front and the back of the kiln, and I'll go around and I'll check all the cones and um, yell out what they're doing, <laughs> and someone will write it down. We try to keep it even, which is always a challenge, um, and, and can tell how even or uneven the kiln is by which cones are melting in which places. Wow. Totally even. Still stoke. It seems like an archaic kind of system and it and it sort of is but it's incredible that it works friends of people who are firing will come or family and we have dinner people bring food and we have some beer and sometimes people play music when we're lucky i really like this kind of firing be for a few reasons. One is that I like the idea and the reality of the fuel that we use for firing to be basically a waste product. Um, it, we use cut off slabs of mostly pine now from the local sawmill just down the road. You know, we're stoking, you know, the whole day and it's not till maybe four o'clock in the afternoon that the first cone will go down. And then we know it's, I don't know, at around 1850 degrees or something. I'm reading. Take it down, take it down.
Ten is bad. I think all the cones are down at top. Usually at about midnight, the kiln is almost hot enough, and that's when we put the salt into the kiln. Um, we fill an angle iron with regular table salt, open a hole in the kiln, put this angle iron in and dump it into the kiln, and the, the salt volatilizes, it becomes a gas, and it fuses with the silica in the pottery, and it makes its own glaze. Okay. Thank you. It feels bumpy. It doesn't look bumpy. Yeah, you definitely got a coating on there. Yeah, but it's, it's so hard to tell because it's right on the edge, you know? And the pots are like all, all packed in there. In there. Right. So, like, you know, when this starts, starts orange peeling, I might say, oh, yeah, okay. Just more salt. You know what I mean? Take another bar. Maybe one. One more. One more. Was that five or? That was five, I think. Five. Okay, plus let's do one, one more. Plus a whole pound of soda. Yeah. If it spreads. Yeah. Yeah. I think one more. What do you think? Anybody? Any objections? Oh, yeah. No. Salt it. Salt away. We have to wait two days after the firing to to unload the kiln till it cools. Nothing ever really looks exactly like you expect. There are always a lot of surprises. Sometimes some things seem disappointing at first and then I really grow to love what's happened to them in the kiln. Sometimes I never do and sometimes things are just like a wonderful gift. The firing always does really nice can do nice things with the glazes, doesn't always. Sometimes it makes mud. <laughs> I have only a little control over what the kiln is going to do. There's so many variables, how dry the wood is, what type of wood we have. I've actually learned as a potter to really let go. There's a lot of delayed gratification in this process and things don't always turn out the way I might like but, and things turn out wonderfully in a way I can't imagine. And I do have to just sort of let that happen.